Well, good morning. My name is Paul Hausman. I'm the privilege to be the pastor of Outreach here, and so glad that you're here this morning to share in this sharing of God's word and worship. So we're going to go this morning to Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, and it should be on the screens. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Lord, bless your word this morning as it goes forth. Well, we're going to recap just a little bit because we're in this series that we're entitling God's Top Ten. The Top Ten Commandments, over 600 commandments that are in the first few books of the Bible. And we know that the commandments are in two tablets, if you will. The first tablet has the first four commandments, and they pertain to our relationship and our obligation towards God. And the second tablet, if you will, commandments 6 through 10, are about our obligation and our relationship towards others. And last week we had heard that when Jesus was asked, what is the top commandment? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your strength. And he followed it up, said that the second one is like that, in that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. And that encompasses all the law and the prophets of loving God, the first tablet, loving others, the second tablet. But this morning, we're still on focusing our obligation and our devotion to God. And the second commandment is about idols. On not giving place to those idols in our life because nothing can and nothing should take God's place in our life. So will you pray with me? Lord, may these words of my mouth and may my heart, the meditation of my heart, be pleasing to you most of all, God. And may these words accomplish something this morning in all of our minds, all of our hearts, in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's text really deals with idols. And the big idea uh, that I want to share is idols. Don't make them. Don't worship them. And those are the don'ts. And God doesn't leave us just with the don'ts, but he tells us the do's, right? Because we want to know what we're supposed to do. Don't make idols. Don't worship them. But love God. And obey his commands. And he gives us a promise. He says, if you do that, I'm going to bless you with my love. And God's love is eternal. And it's better than life itself. It's better than any idol that we could ever or want to make. Right? And we could go home with that. Because that's both practical and applicable. It's something that we could live our whole lives off of. But I've got about 20 minutes to share. So I think that what we ought to do is give some examples of idols that are in the Bible. Some idols that are in society in the hopes that we might recognize what an idol is, what it does. We might recognize some of those things that displace God in our lives in the hopes that when we recognize it, we can turn from those things and turn back to God. Because that's what repentance is, right? It's running from those things that that don't give us life and running to God who gives us life. And then... After we do that, after we're loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and obeying his commands, then we can just relax and receive that love that God wants to lavish on us, right? It's a good thing. But what's an idol? I think that's the first question that we have to answer. And I want to give you a working definition that's simple and easy. See, an idol is anything that gets in between me and God. And I'd like you to repeat this if you would. An idol is anything that gets in between me and God. It's true, right? And the thing is, since the beginning of time, that's exactly what I've done, you've done, everyone has done. I want to go back to Adam and Eve. Might as well start from the beginning. Adam and Eve had perfect relationship with God. Perfect, unbroken. And God told them, one command I want you to obey. One thing that you're not supposed to do. And what happens? 
Satan starts speaking through the serpent and says, if you do that one thing, your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to be just like God, knowing good from evil. But how many of us know that trying to be just like God gets in between our relationship between us and God? It's an idol, right? What was the first commandment? There is a God and he's not me. He's not you either. Why don't we just let God be God in the rightful place. And then when I think of scripture and I think of the most obvious idol that there is, what did the Israelites make in the desert? They made a golden calf, right? So here's Israel. They're in bondage, right? They're in slavery. It's hideous. And God comes and he crushes the false idols of the Egyptians, showing his mighty power. Right? And so then they go out into the desert and they see signs, miracles, and wonders by this powerful God who brings them dry land through the Red Sea. And when they're hungry, he gives them manna in the desert, quail to eat. He gives them this really awesome cloud to shade them from that hot sun and to lead them in the place that they're supposed to go. And he gives them this awesome night light, a pillar of fire at night. And you'd think, this is a God I want to follow all my days with all my actions and devote everything to this awesome God. But what happens? Moses goes away for a little while. And priestly Aaron feels the pressure of the people, gathers all the gold that they took from the Egyptians, and they put it in the fire, and they melt it down, and they make this golden calf. And they bow down, and they worship this idol. Wow, this is what scripture says in Exodus 32.8, they've been quick to turn away from what I've commanded them, and they've made for themselves an idol in the shape of a calf, and they bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Really? After what they just experienced? That just seems dumb, right? Why would, Why? And some people, when they read that, they think, well, they didn't have the commandments. Well, yeah, they did. Let's back up just 12 chapters to what Pastor Dean shared last week to Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. There we go. Thank you. And God spoke all these words. God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God's word says, idols. Don't make them. Don't worship them. <laughs> love God. Obey his commands. And I will lavish you and bless you with love that is better than life. You know, but friends, the thing that's so alluring, that's so attractive about an idol, is we can see an idol. We can touch it. We could even smell it and taste it if we wanted to. But God, not so much, right? But we spend our time, we put our talent, our devotion, our time into making this idol of our own making. And then we bow down and worship it. It's insidious. But you might be thinking, I don't make idols. I've never taken my jewelry and melted it down and make, it, make something out of it to bow down and worship it. So I don't even know why you're sharing this. Because I worship God and I worship God alone. Do you? <laughs> Repeatedly in the Bible, we see where there is people who worship God. They worship Yahweh, but they serve their idols. And I want to give you just one example. The people of Samaria in the book of 2 Kings 1741. They were warned repeatedly, there's idols in your land. And so don't make them. Don't bow down to them. Don't make sacrifices. These are false gods. God alone is worthy of your praise. Bow down to him. Sacrifice to him. Worship God alone. But this is what it says, 2 Kings 17, 41. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. And to this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Ouch. Because today, even today, this day, Sunday, our children and our grandchildren and me, and dare I say, you are doing the same thing. We worship God. That's why we're here. We love God. But we're serving idols. I mean, no one wants to make an idol, right? 
But the thing is, I don't think that we're sensitive to the idols in our life. We might not even be aware of the idols that we have in our lives. Or perhaps we see them, but we're not willing to do something about them. Nothing can take God's place. Nothing should take God's place. I don't think there's anyone in this room who says, oh, I want to become a drug addict or be addicted to pornography or control others, right? But what happens is a good thing slips into our life and it slowly, gradually becomes an idol. I want to give you a list. Because I think that if I give you a list of things briefly, you're going to say, oh, I know someone. That's clearly an idol in their lives. And you might even want to go, I think that's your idol. <laughs> but really what my hope is that you'll recognize some of these. And you'll begin to say, you know what? This is something that displaces God in my life. It gets in between me and God. And when you recognize that, that you'll want to turn from that. And you'll want to receive his love. So here's a, a very partial list here. Perhaps you might recognize some of these in your life. Power. Power is a good thing in itself, right? To have God's power in us and working through us to accomplish more than we can do on our own, that's a good thing. But when you try to hijack that power for yourself, not so much. It gets in between you and God and becomes an idol. How about accomplishment? We can accomplish great things for God and his glory. But when we try to make that accomplishment all about ourselves, it becomes an idol. Our status and reputation. It's good to have a good reputation. We don't want to have a bad reputation. But when all our life is consumed with keeping up with the Joneses and the Kardashians and one another, not so much, right? Not so much. We have control and time. How are we using our time? Is it devotion to God? Or not. Our money, our job, our house, our car, our stuff, the list goes on and on. Our computers. Just think about it for a second. Our iPads, our phones. I love my phone. I've got a Bible app on here. I can go first thing in the morning right straight to God's word. So all that junk that would fill my mind gets pushed away because you can only think one thought at a time. Now I'm thinking about God's word, right? And I can call people, I can text them, I got social media to, I can even see Samuel Cisse and keep in touch with him on my phone. It's a great tool, but I got to recognize that I'm two clicks away from sin that's going to affect my life and can bring me down to where I have an idol that controls me. I don't want that. Television, entertainment, children, activities of all kinds, the list goes on and on and on. But here's the thing. An idol is oftentimes a good thing that gets in the center in that area of life where we make our decisions and it affects how we view ourselves and it displaces God in our lives. Let me unpack just a few more. Our job, our money, our status. Jobs are good. We need to have a job in the society. In fact, the Bible says that if you don't work, you shouldn't eat, so a job is a good thing. But if it becomes the center of our lives, it's in the wrong place. And money, money's not a problem. We can use money for good things. We need it to survive. We can use money to help people who are in need. Money is a good thing. Even a lot of money is not a bad thing. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil that gets in between us and God. In our status... In our reputation, Proverbs says that a reputation is even more valuable and precious than silver and gold. I don't want to have a bad reputation, but sometimes I make everything about me and elevating my reputation, and it takes the place of God in my life. How about you? In that, I think that nothing can take God's place. So let's use our time, let's use our talents, all of our talents, all of our treasures, everything that's God's, and give it back to him. Because when we hold on to things, the tighter we hold on to it, the more it becomes an idol in our life, right? So everything is God's, hold on to it loosely. Serve God with everything we have. What about our relationships? Our relationships, God should always be first, right? 
God first. And God blesses us to have children. And they are a joy. They're a responsibility. We get the privilege of training children in the way that they should go to love and serve the Lord. And it's awesome. But God needs to be first. And if we have the privilege of being married, our spouse should be second. And if we have the privilege of having children, our children should be third. But dare I say in this society, our children become an idol, that they're elevated to a place where they shouldn't be. And Jesus has some really powerful words to say about it. He says this in Matthew 10, 37, Jesus speaking, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And I look at that and I say, Lord, I am not worthy. I want to put you in your right place. But oftentimes, I, I don't. I don't. And this might be a stereotype, but I think it's a powerful truth. That oftentimes, husbands are married to their jobs. And wives, well, they're married to their children. But husbands, you know, we're all the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And God should be number one. However you stack those priorities, right? Number one. But we elevate our job to the neglect of other things, guys. Some women do it too. It's a stereotype that has powerful truth. And women, a lot of times we elevate our children above all else. And if we're married, our spouse should be second. God should be first. Our children should be third, not first. Let's put our priorities in the right place. Jesus in the center of it all, where he needs to be. And then one last example what about pride and low self-esteem? You know, there's some that would walk around and say, you know, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm better than you, <laughs> you know. And as far as intelligence, I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I'm much smarter than you are. I am intelligent. And I'm not bragging because I'm really humble. Humbleness is my strong suit. I'm more humble than you are too, right? And you'd be like, that is just obvious arrogance. But the thing is, you know, for someone to say that is very obvious. But how many of us think that without saying it? Man, come on, it's an idol in your life that needs to be broken. But what about that person who is kind of down on themselves and, you know, they just, you know, I can't really measure up. And, you know, I don't know, I just, I put myself down because I'm just not as good as you. And sometimes we look at those people and we say, they just seem so humble. Well, they're not because they're focusing on themselves. When you think about yourself too much, that's an idol, right? So if we elevate ourselves too high or tear ourselves down too low, it's still a focus on yourself. And it's displacing God and your life. Pride is thinking of yourself too much. This is what God says. God says you are made in his image. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives, moves, and has his being in you. You know, for someone to find dirt in someone, I'm not impressed with that. It's easy to find dirt in anyone. But if we're mining for gold, we push away the dirt so that the gold can be revealed. You have gold in you. So we shouldn't think more highly of ourselves or more lowly of ourselves. Or others. We're on an even playing field. God values you, all of us together, a human kaleidoscope, just like that Revelation passage, right? We're all valuable. And it's all by his grace and his abundant mercy and a great God that loves us. But you might be saying, okay, fine. You know, you've talked about idols in the Bible. You've talked about idols in society. And okay, I'll own up to it. Maybe I have some idols in my life. But I don't worship them. No, I don't worship them. But let me say this. Anything that we give our minds attention to or our hearts affection to are our objects of worship. Sometimes we worship Jesus. Sometimes we worship food. You know, sometimes our idols, they're, they're obvious. Sometimes we think that we can hide them. Other people see them. Regardless, God sees those idols. And we can worship anything. Sometimes we worship football. <laughs> Just when I thought that was the most obvious idol was golden calf worship. 
this comes up, and I say, oh my gosh, where in our society has the most well-attended worship services that are passionate, that are devoted, where people have the right uniform and all the right apparel, and they invest so much of their time, their talent, and their treasure into it, and they can't wait to get together with one another, to worship together. They know all the stats. They know everything about it. They invest so much into it. Well, it's most likely sports arenas and concerts, right? Ouch. But does that mean that we shouldn't go to the game or the concert? Heavens no, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is good things can insidiously slide into something that stands in between worship of God. Nothing can take his place. Nothing should take his place. Idols, don't make them. Don't worship them. But rather love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Obey his commands and receive the blessing of his love. Can you imagine... A reversal of seeing everything that's wrong with society and everyone joined together. Learning that we can follow Jesus, that we can become disciples who make disciples, who in turn make more disciples and join together with that kind of enthusiasm, with that kind of commitment, with that kind of devotion to God. The one who gives us life. That's better than anything that we can have in this earth. It's really a hard issue, right? But we need to recognize it with our head and do something about it. But what do we do? I mean, I look at myself and, and when I think, at least how I view it, is I love God with all of my heart. I love God with all my soul and passion and being. And I, I love him so much. But I recognize so many things that stand in the way of my true devotion to God. So many things. So many things. How about you? What stands in between you and total devotion to God, who's worthy of our total devotion? What rises above worship of God in your life? This is what I want to ask you to do. I want you to, if you would, commit to me 20 seconds of time to focus in and ask God, say, God, what is standing in between me and you? And when you recognize that, what I want us to do is run from them, turn from them, run back to the God who gives us life. That's called repentance. And make sure that we don't go back again. Renounce that thing. I'm never going to do that again. And then when we're loving God, obeying his commandments, we can relax a little bit because we know that he's going to bless us with his love, which is better than life. All right, will you give me 20 seconds and focus asking God, what is it that's standing in between you and me? Here we go. Ready? Go. That's quick, right? Did you get something? There's so much more. <laughs> but we probably can't contain it and deal with it today. But we can deal with what God is laying on our heart today. And what I'd like us to do is just pray a prayer confession together. And it's going to be on the screen. I want us to read this slowly because I want it to be more than words. Because if it's just words, it lacks power. It could still do something great. But if we do this with our heart. God can do something powerful in yours and my life today, and that's my heart's desire. So let's read this together. Lord God, I love you, and I want to obey your commands. Thank you for helping me to recognize my idols for what they are and what they do. I make you my Lord, and I worship you. I acknowledge and confess my idolatry to you. I have taken things that are good and made them idols that get in the way of keeping you in the center of my life. I choose to turn from my sin back to you. I repent for making anything or anyone more important than you. I repent for rebelling against you. 
I want to obey your commands. I love you and receive your love as I seek you in the center of my thoughts, words, and actions. Center me in you and renew a right relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And the positive thing in all this, you know, we spent time in this agonizing thing. If you've engaged in this, it might have been agonizing for you. But, you know, the positive side is that God promises, he promises us to bless us with his love, which is eternal of utmost importance. There's nothing better than that. So simply this, this is what I want us to do. This is what I want to do. Don't make idols. Don't worship them. Love God. Obey his commandments and be blessed in his love because there's nothing more valuable because nothing can take his place. Nothing should take his place. Nothing can take God's place.